Scientific Grace presents Tracing Summaries 2021 The ineffable words of God that over edify us and lead us towards the great transformation. And look at chapter 3 of the first letter to Timothy, verse 16. Let's see the mystery of deity or godliness. It says, without question, great is the mystery. You see the word mystery there? Great is the mystery of godliness, deity. And what is the mystery of deity? That God was what? That God was manifest in what? In the flesh. And when was God manifest in flesh? In the person of Jesus Christ. And then who was Jesus Christ? God. Jesus Christ was the Son. It was God Himself. What happens is that everything that a woman birth, you have to call a child. I couldn't say Mary had a beautiful father. No, the problem was that God said is that that son was God. It wasn't that God had a son. It was that God manifest himself in flesh. And when he was manifest in flesh, he was known as the son of God. That was the mystery that when you read history, the disciples, they were confused. Philip said, oh man, we are confused because it's that you speak of God and then you yourself forgive sin, and only God can forgive sin. So then you say that God will send the Spirit, and then you blow into someone the next day. <laughs> Receive. So why don't you show us the Father so we get out of this confusion? So he says, Philip, don't you know that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? But Philip didn't understand that. In other words, my Spirit is God. My flesh, it's called Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is not God. He is the one that dwells in, within Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is a vehicle to gather the sins of man, a lamb to forgive all the sins. But he that is within Jesus of Nazareth is God himself. That's why Philip says, Acts, show us the Father and it'll be enough. Just show him to us. Philip was asking for an audience, a little meeting behind the mountain. Listen, Father, here, I present Philip. Hey, how are you? No, I can't. I am. I am. <laughs> there was confusion among them, but Jesus could not explain that because his purpose was for them to be confused so they can kill him because if they had discovered that he was God, you think they're going to kill him? So he did that purposely. Sometimes he would say, and this is where the Jehovah's Witnesses get confused, because sometimes he would say, my father is greater than I. Certainly the father is greater than the flesh. But the Jehovah's Witnesses use that to say, you see, you realize that the father is greater than him? So let's go with Jehovah and leave the son. But is that the son is Jehovah? So then Paul, only Paul, only Paul says, this is without question. God was manifest in flesh. So the mystery of iniquity says that God was not manifest in flesh, but that God had a son with the womb of Mary. God stood in heaven, but he begot in Mary a son. Look how infinite it is. Look, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses all teach, oh, how good to be this son of God. And with that, they deceive you because that is the principle of iniquity to say that he isn't God. The mystery is that God was manifest in that body. That is the same problem you have. You have that problem because you live with people that see your flesh, but they don't see your spirit. So then they judge you by the weaknesses of your flesh when you are not that. You are perfect. It's the same problem you have. You have that problem because you know that with one offering, he's perfected you forever. But if your husband or your wife or your uncle or your aunt or your companion or neighbor 
or a family member that moved in with you don't know this, one day he sees you a little bit on the other side, and he's saying he's perfect with one offering, and it's true, you're perfect, but he saw your imperfections. So if he's confused and know you according to the flesh, he violates a principle against you. Oh, and he can receive punishment behaving good and you're behaving badly. He receives a punishment. Hello. Look, <laughs> look how paradoxical this is that you see a brother misbehaving and unjustly you mistreat him. And then the angels that know you in spirit and not in the flesh, why is he mistreating that person? Then uh, an angel makes your life impossible. And then you say, oh, this is unjust. He that misbehaved and I'm the one that got the whipping? Well, shut your mouth and don't get into these matters and know no one according to the flesh. That is the problem of this mystery. This is a mystery. Say a mystery. Don't you see that the first one that respects that principle is God? He don't know you according to the flesh. So if you don't think as God does, you judge and then God punishes you for judging something that he's asked you not to know according to the flesh. This is problematic. This is a mystery. A mystery. Where were we? What detour? Hello. Let's then look to where was it born or unfolded the mystery of iniquity. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. That is why Paul said that your liberty does not become a stumbling act to another. Don't you see that there are people that are weak in faith? So then Paul sometimes was told, are you hungry, Paul? Man, I am starving, brother. I haven't eaten in two days in this trip. There is meat there, but it's been sacrificed to idols. He says, what idols? That's all nonsense. Give me a piece of that and he would eat it. But if there was a religious one from circumcision beside him, he would get offended. And Paul says, don't by eating meat offend the conscience of one that's weak in faith. That's why you have to select the people whom you walk with, people that are mature, because your freedoms, you have to know to, how to manifest them. Because your freedom that for you is nonsense, the other one is tearing himself apart and judging you. And then the angels whom they punish it's the one being torn apart. And you that are the one at fault pass justified smoothly. Let's go to chapter 23, verse 12. Verse 12. The plot against Paul. And when it was day, some of the Jews banned, some of the what? Jews banned together and bond themselves under oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed what? Paul. And they were doing this fasting and praying. Now, they were what? In verse 13, now there were more than 40 those who have formed this conspiracy. Now hear this, having came to the chief priests and whom? The elders who received them with joy. Remember the elders in chapter 21, verse 17, that they were received with joy. The elders received them with joy. You know who were here? The apostles and the chief priests. All of that Sanhedrin, that authority of Jerusalem, those 40 went to the church, to the leader of the church. And look at what they said. Let's repeat verse 14, who having came to the chief priests and the elders said, we have bond ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we should kill Paul. Do you give us permission? It looks like the elders says, definitely wipe him out. Now you therefore together with the consul, let's 
listen, listen to what they, the eldest, the eldest said to the elder said to the 40. So now, therefore, with the consul, suggest to the commander that he be brought before us as if we wanted to inquire concerning him a little more information, and we will be ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister's son, that blessed sister's son, heard of their ambush, it looks like the son of the sister of Paul worked in the console, maybe picking up paper. And, and he heard and said, what bandits these apostles, they want to kill my uncle. Remember that Paul said that he witnessed the death of Stephen. And probably the apostles said, this man is an assassin. We have to kill him. He's against the law of Moses. This man, not good that he continues to live. So it says that the sister's son heard of the ambush and he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions, said to him, take this young man to the commander. Hello, are we here? For he has something to tell him. And so he brought him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to say to you. So then the commander took him by the hand and went aside and asked privately, what do you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews. The young man spoke clearly. The Jews have agreed to ask it was approved by the elders to ask that you bring Paul down to the consul tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not believe them. Listen. So then he told them, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the consul as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But don't believe them, because more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bond themselves an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. And now they are awaiting your promise, your promise. So then the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. He lived as a Gentile and not as a Jew. He was the chief of the corporation, the circumcision of the Opus Dei of the circumcision. He's the chief of that organization, but he's not living what's right as a Jew must live. So he would live as a Gentile, but then that was a camouflage he used to sneak in within the Gentiles because he was wise. That man did not want the Gentiles to find their true identity. He didn't want that. It says, Paul tells him, why do you compel Gentiles to Judaize? What's wrong with you, Peter? How can you be so disobedient when Jesus of Nazareth in the days of his flesh told you not to go in the way of the Gentiles. And now you are eating with them. You are within them, posing to be a Gentile as a hypocrite, not conducting yourself as a Jew. You are afraid of your own people that find you in this hypocrisy. It's like those that come here, hey, bless. Then someone sees them from their organization. No, I said bless, but... I'm not a part of them. I'm, I was there because I'm just investigating something, not that I believe in them. Well, that's the way Peter was. So then, what does this mean? How can you confide in leaders that are in this condition, that are the ones that begun Catholicism in Rome? There is where, there is where the basis of all of the hypocrisy and in preaching all of that falsehood, that's why there is poverty in the villages. That's why there are crimes committed. Don't you see that that gospel doesn't allow for you to find your true identity? 
So that's where evil was hidden. If they didn't give you grace, they give you the law. And if they gave it to you mixed, that does not bring a good conscience. They harm children, damage families. So then that crime must be denounced. I would love to be able to explain it nationally, to explain that we're not evil people that hate. If pastors were a little more sane and listen to me, listen to me carefully and take notes. Because one must judge according to what the person says. And they are obstructing the way of others that are desiring this information. When they call me a false prophet, a heretic, hey, be careful with that one speaking there. Don't cooperate. Don't go there. They're stopping them. They don't eat nor let others eat. So then the hypocrisy of circumcision is more serious than what we can imagine. Let's see. The books of circumcision, let's identify those eight books. After Hebrews, there are eight books. Let's look for errors, simple, because we can't go through all the books, but we can take out eight errors of the books of circumcision. I'm referring to James, 1st, 2nd of Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd of John, Jude, and the book of Revelation. Why those books you can't read them with confidence. For that, you have to place filters. Wait a minute, because I am in Apache territory. <laughs> that territory is of another spirit. It's another gospel. It is another Jesus. Therefore, you have to be careful with those eight books. So then, let's look to the book of James 2, verse 24. So you can see the blaspheme that's locked up there. Look at the first error, and we're going to compare it with the writings of Paul. It says, you see then that a man is justified by what? By works and not by faith only. Look at the power he gives to works. A man is justified by works. And then on the sideline, and not only by faith only. Why does James speaking like that, because there was someone else speaking that it was through faith. Who was saying it? Paul. You have to understand the evil that is in these men. Listen, this religious system wants to justify Paul with James. For years, I've been hearing them. Be a doers of the word and not only hearers. What are you going to do with that flesh? You can't do nothing. Every good gift comes down from the father of lights. Because Paul says God sends them a power of error. How is God going to send a power of error? Because everyone wanted to paint God. That's a cute and beautiful God. He's, he's a God of love. No, no, no. No, you can't speak strong because God is love. That is what they want to cover your mouth with. But no, look at the blaspheme. You see then that a man is justified by works. It seems like the works here are more important than faith here. It is to say, oh, faith counts, but works more. Now look at, look at what Romans says to see, but maintain this thought here, what we just went over. But now look at what the apostles, the apostle to the Gentiles says in chapter 3, verse 27, and so forth. Look at the difference. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Say no! but by the law of faith. Conclusion. This is a conclusion. If you don't come and arrive to this conclusion, you're going nowhere. Another spirit will set in. The covering will reject you quickly. Be careful with this man, with this woman, with this teacher that is mixing. So then look at what Paul says. We conclude that a man is justified by works. No, by faith. And what do we do with works? Without the works 
of the law. And then look at what it says. Is God the God of Jews only? No. Isn't God also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, because God is one and he shall justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. That is the true faith. Say, that is my faith. Say to he that's beside you, that is my faith. The faith that saves. So what are we going to do with James? Out. That book, can you confide in it? No. Should we rip it out of the Bible? No, we can't do that. <laughs> I would love to burn it, but we have to leave it there because then they'll accuse us. Uh, we're taking books out of the Bible and we're only taking books out of the Bible. It is identifying where the evil is. Because if they were to remove it before, we would never see the evil. Thank God that they left them there. As a matter of fact, thank God they left the 14 epistles because they were so evil that they were capable of destroying the 14 and just leaving theirs. Let's go then to the first letter to Peter. The book of circumcision of a curse. 5.8 5.8. What does it say? Be sober-minded. Watch your adversary, the one that's been defeated, the one that was destroyed, but he sees him as the devil yet. Prowls about as a roaring lion seeking around about whom to devour. And then he adds faith, well, resist and stand firm in faith. And with that, you conform. But you're not noticing that that's another card. I'm telling them to use faith, but I'm telling them that the devil is alive and standing. And that is a form of saying, I believe. It's like the Catholics that tell you, oh, that Jesus was risen. Oh, but you're lost. The blood of Jesus did nothing for you. You're still in sin. Oh, the Lamb of God took the sins of the world, but he didn't take anything. Yeah, it's a form. That is the mystery of iniquity, that they say they believe, but deep down, there's nothing. That's why they're clouds without waters. They're hollow subtleties. So then, look at what it says. Well, Hebrews 2.14, you already know it. Let's read it, though. In as much then as the children, that is predestination there also. They were children, but had no flesh. They were children, but in partaking of flesh and blood. It says that God himself also shared in the same, in the person of whom? Of Jesus of Nazareth. That through death, he might destroy, he died, right? So then he was destroyed. If he died, it means he, he was destroyed. So why does Peter says he's still like a roaring lion? Him who had, he has nothing anymore. The power of death, that is the devil. So now look at what John Two, oh, 12, 31, John, which was a moderator and a, an advisor of circumcision, a very personal friend of Peter and James, look at what he says in 12, 31. Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He spoke like that before because here, he was as a reporter. But after Paul appeared, he became an editor. He edited. Let's write against Paul. That first letter, second and third of John, that was him personally. But this was inspired by God. This was historically well done. 
But then he converted uh, to an editor, the owner of the newsletter. And Peter says a bunch of other nonsense. Add to your faith, virtue. You add to your faith? Faith is a gift. To gifts, you don't add anything. The gift is manifest. He says, add to your faith and many other mistakes and errors. Let's look to John now, to the editor. Look at the first era. And this he wrote 90 years after Christ died, John still thought this way. If we say we have no sin, but the Lamb of God removed the sin with one offering, he perfected you forever. No, that's Paul, that heretic that we're trying to wipe out. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if he's already forgiven you, why are you going to continue confessing them? Notice that when Christ appeared to me, the first thing, the first thing he told me was Romans 6.3. You are dead to sin. You no longer sin. You cannot be found in sin. That was the first thing he told me. And he repeated about 45 times the same, just this part. That, listen, I don't, I don't get headaches. I don't know what's that. But in that revelation, I would plead that he forgives. I already know it. I heard it. I know it. I memorized it. Why repeat it so much? I know it. And it's because he was, he was uh, warning me. We must repeat this and repeat it. Forget about if you said it last month. You have to continue to repeat it. Because we must repeat while all of that religious wax is removed that you've been, that's been placed there since you were a child. That must be removed. And repetition, it's what's best. I know you know this, but you're hearing it today as if you've never heard it. You are assimilating this truth because you love others. And though you say, well, I know this and I'm clear, but how about your neighbor and your visitors? They need to hear it, so I'll support it. What does uh, Hebrews 10, 14 say? Brethren, these are the basis of the last reformation. With this is what we're going to change the world. It's not shooting uh, guns nor insulting people or breaking images. That you do for a while. The world we're going to change with the written evidence. These are the basis of the last reformation. With this is what we're going to change the world. It's not shooting uh, guns nor insulting people or breaking images. That you do for a while. The world we're going to change with the written evidence. You know why? Because this is like a magnet. This, the other part of the magnet, they have it in their Bible. What I am saying, it's in their Bibles. What happens is that they have not approached. When they, who love the truth, approach, they'll click. They're going to meet because the truth is by the truth. And the amador of truth sooner or later falls. You are going to see what's written. That is my job. That is my ministry. That is why I dare call myself the man Christ Jesus without difficulty. But it's for that purpose. But if I had not that purpose, I would be a charlatan, as they say. Because that, it's what gives validity to the man Christ Jesus. What I am saying, that is the man Christ Jesus. You can take me away, but that's the man Christ Jesus, the content. Your firmness. This is an indestructible kingdom. You know what's indestructible? There's no one who can touch this. There isn't a devil they can invent. There isn't a Roman papacy. There is no consul.
so. There is no one who can move this foundation. No one can. No one. They cannot. This is forever. The truth of the gospel. The eternal gospel. Jesus Christ man already started. And he can't stop. And I tell these people, well, and if it weren't me and it's someone else or another that's coming, what is he going to do? No, no, no. He's coming. What is he coming for? Well, he's coming for his church. For what? He's coming to look for that bunch of troubled believers. He's going to call that churches. People who are denying him the blood, they trample, trample the blood of Jesus every Sunday in their churches. They have the devil alive, which Christ came to destroy on the cross. I'm going to tell you something. If another appears, he's wasting his time because the only one that's edifying the church with the true gospel is Jesus Christ, man. This is the reform of the church. There is no other. Do not expect it because there is nothing else. Second letter of John, chapter 1, verse 9. Second John. Take notes, bless. Look how John dared to speak. Look at the falsehood here. Whatever, whoever transgresses, what, that there was someone that he thought were transgressors? Yes, he would think of the disciples of Paul that way, or any of them, well, those of Paul, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the one with the beard and the little child, the father and the son. So John says that you have to have the doctrine of Christ, right? And what does Paul say in Hebrews or in Romans 6.1? John says that you must have the doctrine of Jesus. So then Paul says in Hebrews 6.1, therefore leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ. And what is the perfection? Grace. And why must we leave the doctrines of Jesus? Because he was, number one, he wasn't Christian. Number two, because the doctrines Jesus Christ followed were the doctrines of Moses. So why you have to love the doctrines of Christ? That expired. That expired. That is condemnation. That was a covenant of death that he came to fulfill so you don't fall into that trap. That is a old newspaper that has expired. You have to leave that. Paul says, leaving the rudiments. Abandon all of that. Mark, Luke, John. That is history. Old history. The true history begins from Romans to Hebrews. The gospel of uncircumcision. Galatians 1.8. We gave emphasis to circumcision, and now we're going to speak about uncircumcision. Paul says, but even if we, and maintain that word in your mind, or an angel, not from hell, because hell has been destroyed and it doesn't exist. So what remains are angels from heaven. So then Paul says, even if an angel from heaven preached any other gospel to you than what I, Paul, preaches to you, let him be an anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be anathema. Revelations 1.1, 1, 1. just in case you want to continue reading that book, that little book where they vomit you and they kick you around and and they bring horns and horses and symbols 
the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show the servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel. <laughs> if an angel from heaven preaches a different gospel from what I teach, let him be accursed. And now the angel appears to the servant John that's in the island of Patmos fasting. And Paul had already warned him about the truth of this gospel. And he continued with that broken record. So then he went to fast and pray over there. So then God said, let's give him a little revelation. Angel, you know that God has many angels. Remember that he was sent angels to speak through the prophets, to lie to the kings. So which is the biggest liar in this old covenant? This is the one that deceived the, the king? Come here. I need you to do me a favor. This young man, John, for as much as I warned him, and I sent Paul to him, and I've proven and proven and proven over and over this truth. And they also kill my apostle. And 30 years after, he comes with this broken record of the book of Revelation. Let's send him that angel, that the angel speak to him. Let's go to Titus. Prepare for what's coming. Let yourself be used. Let yourself be used. Confess the covenant. Confess the covenant. Do not deny anything Paul tells you. Paul says you are a God. Paul says you are a treasure. Paul says you are rich. Paul says you are the owner of all things. Maintain it because in a blink of an eye, when your body is transformed, then you will see, you will see great things.